On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks fall short in Oklahoma City, having their four-game winning streak snapped with a loss on this Monday evening. We'll have a full breakdown of the game and much more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1583 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Monday evening into Tuesday. And today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. And if you're a new customer right now, you can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks right now. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Also, encourage you at the top of the podcast, as I always do, to make us your first listen each and every day. Please check out the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, places like Apple and Spotify on the audio side. And we're also on YouTube on the video side and today's show will focus on what became a relatively competitive loss for the Hawks on Monday in Oklahoma City 126 to 117 the Hawks were down really the entire way in this game and in the first half they just could not score honestly they couldn't make a shot in the first half process wise it wasn't so bad but still results results wise really ugly in the first half the third quarter was kind of a two-way falter I would say from Atlanta poor defense poor offense etc In the fourth, they were valiant, though. They closed, actually, the deficit was up uh, up to 19 points in the third quarter for the Hawks against the Thunder. And by the crunch time period, the Hawks were within five, but not quite enough to get over the hump. And as a result, the Hawks fall, had their four-game winning streak snapped. And they had a chance tonight, actually, to match their longest streak from all of last season. The Hawks only won five games in a row once last year. And they almost did it again tonight but uh, not quite enough to get all of that done. So if you're a new listener to the podcast, what we do at the top of the podcast is give you some takeaways from the game, some big picture observations that we'll sort of drill down in the middle with regard to how the game flowed and some more nuts and bolts stuff. And at the end of the podcast, my player by player evaluations from this contest, but big picture, I would say the offensive struggles were the big story of the night for Atlanta in Oklahoma city. They did score 40 points in the fourth quarter to kind of boost their overall numbers and their overall efficiency in this game. And with that said, they had a 110 offensive rating in the game. That isn't good by this team's standards by any by any means. Uh, and you throw in the fact that until the fourth quarter, which was some, I won't say garbage time, but certainly like they were playing faster. They were playing kind of that, you know, balls to the wall style, for, back, for lack of a better term. And one of those things where the Hawks just, uh, you know, for the first three quarters just had really big issues, I would say, offensively. They ended up in this game shooting 40% on twos. That is terrible. Uh, from three-point range, they were 14 to 42. That actually was decent by the end, uh, thanks to a late bump from the Hawks on offense uh, for, for three-point range. But in typical Quinn Snyder fashion, actually, after the game, he said that he would have liked the Hawks to take at least 10 more threes. So um, I actually agree. They passed on some shots in the first half of this game. But um, some individual stuff as well, like, for instance, Trey Young and, and DeAndre Hunter combined to shoot 7 of 31 from the field in this game. Uh, 1 of 14 from 3 combined from Hunter. Jalen Johnson, Garrison Matthews, who appeared in this game, as we'll come back to him in a second, and then Anjika Kongu as well. Those four guys, one of 14 from three. But look, I, wrote, I wrote, actually wrote on my Patreon preview about this game and how the offensive glass was going to be a huge potential advantage for the Hawks. And it ended up being exactly that. In fact, the Hawks had 25 offensive rebounds in this game. That is an absolute ton in an NBA game. But they actually didn't convert them very well. They ended up with 19 second chance points. And that's a really good number. That's like way above the league average, like near the top of the league in second chance points. But it isn't a lot when you have 25 offensive rebounds. So they were not efficient when they actually got second chances. Lots of like missed tips and missed shots around the rim. And then they ended up, this is probably the stat of the game, big picture. The Hawks ended up taking seven more shots than the Thunder from the field and nine more free throws than the Thunder from the field. And still lost this game by nine points. Like if all you know, like nothing else about a game, if all you know, is that one team takes seven more shots and nine more free throws, they are very likely to win because they are taking more shots. You can actually shoot poorly or more poorly than your opponent and still win because you have more more opportunities. But the Hawks did their job when it comes to the possession battle in this game, but it was not quite enough because they just could not make shots again. I don't think the process was so bad in the first half. We'll come back to that later on a little bit more about the shot selection in the first half. The third quarter, they kind of lost the plot with ball security. They had seven turnovers in the third quarter. That was really rough. 
And they play well on offense in the fourth, for sure, but it was largely a night to forget on offense. The Thunder are an interesting team defensively. They're not big, but they do have a lot of skilled guys. They have some good perimeter defenders like Lou Dort and uh, Jalen Williams. Jack Holmgren is a pretty good defender already, despite the fact that he's a rookie in the, in the league. But still a night where the offense was not good enough. And for this team, which is a top five offense in the league so far this year, and I think on paper should be that good, they just were not that good in this game. Uh, defensively. It was a little bit underwater by the end. They had about a 116, 117 offensive rating uh, allowed to the Thunder. That isn't very good, honestly. Um, Hat tip to the Thunder. They made a couple of shots. I can think of three, four, five of them off the top of my head right now that were very, very difficult attempts that they made. You know, Jalen Williams, uh, the second Jalen Williams, had one of those that was kind of like a shrug shot. Uh, a couple of contested shots from Shea and Lou Dort. Like, that's going to happen sometimes. Also, the Thunder made 22 to 23 from free throw line. That's going to happen too, but certainly you would not expect it to happen every night. The Thunder, the Thunder did lead the league in drives the last two seasons in a row, and that was apparent in this game. The Hawks did a decent job, I thought, against two-pointers. Like They weren't totally breaking down for most of this game defensively. They rebounded very well on the defensive glass. Um, they, they were bad in transition. Now, part of that was turnovers in the third quarter in particular, but they gave up 32 fast break points. That's a very bad number. In fact, the Thunder had 1.6 points per possession in transition in this game. That is wildly high and bad end to end so if you're looking for things to nitpick on defense i would say uh mostly it was the not getting back on defense and allowing the thunder kind of have you know free reign in transition but look they're tough they're tough matchup for anybody with the way they play it's a unique style i try to commit on my, on my patreon preview as well thunder kind of play a way that nobody else plays in the league um a little bit more conventional a little bit more conventional now which at Holmgren, they, they actually have a center who can protect the rim, but even he plays on the perimeter on offense a lot. They play five out on offense a lot. They're not small at guard, but they're small in the front court for the most part. So just an interesting matchup all the way across, as we'll talk about later on, that also led to the Hawks playing a little bit smaller on their own. On their own side, Capella played less, Kongwu more. That makes sense in this game, but it's just a tough, tough matchup. And I really thought the Hawks... You know, in the third quarter, look, the third quarter was really frustrating, as we'll come back to later on as well. I thought that's where the Hawks lost this game. The first half, they kind of overcame the poor shooting and were at least hanging around despite really bad shooting, which is going to happen sometimes in the league. The way they played the third quarter was frustrating. I'm both into the floor, and that will, that's kind of more damning to me than the defense was on the whole in this game. A little bit of context setting before we move on to the, to the rest of the podcast. Um, this actually got a lot of attention, even nationally today. Uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander, who is the best player for the Thunder, was an All-NBA guard last year. Very, very good player. He was, he was listed as out on Sunday evening and Monday morning on the official NBA injury report. Then he was upgraded to questionable midday today on Monday, and then he was ruled to be good to go two hours before the game. So that's not a usual path, let's just say. It's not unprecedented. I'll say that. It, it, it does happen in the, NBA, in the NBA sometimes, but it's definitely rare, and I got a lot of questions about this. So Justin Fan of Underdog Fantasy, who's actually great at this kind of stuff, tracking, um, he did tell me on Twitter – that is something that actually OKC particularly did a lot sometimes last year. Um, I'm sure the league does not love what transpired here. And I personally, this is my personal opinion now, don't think you should be able to actually have someone list, listed as out the night before and the morning of and then had that guy play in the game. I think if there is any chance on the team side, you should have to list the guy as at least doubtful or he can't play in the game. That actually, that's, just, that's just me. That's not a league rule, obviously. I think the league might say something to the Thunder on this one because it's Shea, it's their most prominent player, and he was listed as out for like 15 hours on the injury report. Like that's not something that – it was not an accident. So we'll see. But anyway, long story short, I'm sure they'll get a call of some kind, but that happened in this game. And look, I said this on Twitter today too. If, as an analyst and as someone who's trying to be impartial about this stuff, I would I would rather watch Hawks Thunder with Shea playing because it's a good test for the Hawks, et cetera. But um, obviously it would have been an easier game with the Hawks for the Hawks if he had not played. And just more uh, interesting and weirdness, honestly, on that front. For the Hawks, no major injuries other than Buffkin and Wes Matthews, who are both already out in this game. But interestingly enough, as we sort of set the stage for, for how this game went, our friends at FanDuel made the Hawks three and a half point favorites in this game as of Sunday evening and Monday morning. Again, that's with Shea out. Then, once Shea was ruled in, the line moved all the way to the Thunder being favored by one. So the Hawks were actually underdogs at the close of the game tonight. Now, that illustrates the value of Shea, who is a star player. So four and a half points sounds about right to me, whatever it is. But um, the Hawks ended up being underdogs in this spot, despite being pretty decent sized favorites as of Monday morning through all of that. But look, is this a terrible loss? No. Did the Hawks play well? Also no, for the most part. Um, I thought they were at least 
interestingly enough, like competitive to be in this game. Like, you know, Quinn talked about that after the game as well. Like they could have rolled over when they weren't making shots. They, they didn't really do that. And I think on the whole, the Hawks have shown some pretty interesting resilience this year, even when they've fallen short in some of these games, like Charlotte, for, the, for instance, that first game of the year, et cetera. But still, this is not a great performance for the Hawks. And obviously, after the four-game winning streak, they're maybe due for some letdown on some level. But it kind of came in this game, uh, not a dreadful loss by any means, but one that was uh, not fantastic across the board. Okay, we'll have more on this game in a second when it comes to the nuts and bolts of how this game unfolded. But first, it worth from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Step into the action this NBA or NFL season with America's number one sportsbook. And of course, that is FanDuel. If you're a new customer, get $100 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks right now if your team wins. Beyond the awesome perks of signing up with FanDuel, they have all stuff you're looking for across the sports betting space. They have over-unders and point spreads and money lines and player props and live betting, future bets, and much more. The app is safe and secure. They cover the whole range of sports that you might be interested in as well. Of course, they have the NBA, they have football stuff, NFL, college football, they have MLB, they have WNBA, college basketball, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, MMA, boxing, the whole thing. It's all there for you at FanDuel. They also have a lot of Hawk stuff, as you might imagine, including the whole offerings uh, when it comes to the upcoming game on Thursday in Mexico City. That's going to be a national game. A lot of attention on Hawks Magic, and they'll have pregame lines, they'll have in-game lines, all that stuff is available for you at FanDuel. And now, it's the best possible time, best possible time to set up with the folks at FanDuel right now. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Check out the official sportsbook partner of Locked On Podcast Network with an offer that you will absolutely not want to miss. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. All right, so a lot to get to with the way this game unfolded. And I kind of thought they might, I want to stress, might start this game a little bit weird with Capella guarding Lou Dort. And because they started Jalen Johnson in this one, which is not a huge surprise, but it was the first time that the Hawks have started Jalen in a game where the opponent was not playing a big star level power forward. I talked about this a little bit earlier on the week, I guess in the last week, is that the Hawks have started Jalen against Carl Anthony Towns, against Giannis, and against Zion. And this game, yes, Jalen Williams is a very promising player, but he's not a, like a huge power forward size player right now. And also is an established star like Zion and Giannis and Towns. So that was a interesting change to me. I didn't mind it, but they did kind of go more traditional. It was it was Capella on Chet. They actually had Trey hiding on Lou Dort. And then it was Dort on Trey um, on the other side of the floor. And they had Hunter guarding Shea Gilders Alexander for the most part in this game. No, no, no huge surprise. Just something I would at least put a, put a pin in. Uh, a couple of nice blocks early on in this game for the Hawks, two by Capella, and then one by Jalen Johnson on, on Josh Giddy. But not a whole lot of positives other than that in the in the early going. It was 14 to five by Oklahoma City to open open the game. They made their first four threes, whereas the Hawks were one of one of eleven from the field to open the game. So that kind of bled into you know the Hawks have been bad in the first quarter this year. Now they actually by the end of the quarter we're only down by one, so they're actually only minus 15 points in seven games now the first quarter, but still you don't want to be underwater with your, with your starting lineup on the floor. And um, while a lot of attention has been paid to the starting lineup when it's um, Sadiq instead of Jalen tonight, it was kind of the same thing with Jalen starting. So a slow start. We'll see how they address that in the future. Um, rotationally, no huge surprises here. Bay and bogey came in as the first subs as the mid quarter timeout. Then Johnson actually came back in pretty, pretty quickly to, along with the Kongu. So kind of a, a shorter stint on the bench for Jalen. They actually had young bogey Bay Johnson and the Kongu out there late in the quarter and then the Hawks actually put Jalen on Shea when Hunter left the game. Now, they kind of had to because they were playing a lineup that it didn't have Murray or Hunter, and you can't really put Trey or Sadiq Bey on Shea. So it kind of had to be Jalen. He didn't play great there. I think Hawks fans have probably overstated his ability to defend, especially like guards on the perimeter. Like he's obviously, the ta he's the talent is very undeniable, but he's not comfortable yet with that, like screen navigation and kind of just perimeter you know, footwork, all that stuff. He did a fine job. It was just kind of notable to me that they, they, had, they asked him to do that because they kind of had to in this game. A good job at the end of the quarter on offensive glass from Sadiq and Jalen on the final possession. Offensive rebounds too led. That actually led to a tip in by Jalen. The buzzer cut the lead down to one. Um, they were not good offensively. Couldn't make a shot, but, but still were able to hang around there. Um, for the second straight game, Garrison Matthews played ahead of A.J. Griffin. Now, people were asking me to ask Quinn Snyder. I am not in Oklahoma City, so I couldn't ask that question. Um, I suspect we wouldn't get a very in-depth answer from, from Quinn as to why. But Matthews played one stint, four minutes. Um, and look, this is something I've talked about a lot. Um, I think Quinn is committed now pretty clearly to when everybody's healthy. It's going to be eight guys for sure. 
And then it's going to be maybe a ninth. And if that guy plays, it's going to be very, very limited. AJ was playing not a lot of minutes before he started not playing. Now Garrison's played two stints, one stint per game in the last two. I'm not as bothered by this as some Hawks fans are. Look, would I play AJ over Garrison Matthews? Yes, I would. But um, is four minutes of AJ going to make a difference that much over four minutes of Garrison Matthews? Probably not. And I I would like to see AJ play more. But I also just – Quinn's just trying to kind of grind it out right now with, with eight guys. I don't necessarily love that big picture. I want, I, I want if I'm a Hawks fan, AJ to play more minutes than this. But it's also clear to me that he is nine of nine right now for the Hawks. So um, I thought coming into the year there was a decent chance at some point we would see Wes Matthews over AJ because they invested in Wes Matthews. They went out actively and signed him. He's a veteran guy, better defender. Um Garrison Matthews is a little bit different because I don't know if he's a better defender than AJ. I think he's more experienced than AJ defensively, but he is smaller. Um, obviously, the shooting is Garrison's um, hook for the most part, and AJ is good at that too. So um, for Hawks fans asking me why this why this would be, I don't have a great answer for you. I think I might just be seeing what Garrison has, tickering a little bit. But in the end, it's four minutes per game right, right now for the, for the last two games for Garrison. So I don't have like a huge sweeping hot take other than I would be playing AJ if I had to choose. Um, early in the quarter, it was like kind of scattered. Both of the floor from the Hawks. Um, they defended pretty well, I thought, for the most part. But they, again, opened up 0 of 8 from the floor in the second quarter. Just rough shooting the entire way, really. In fact, the Hawks were down by two mid-second quarter, despite shooting uh, 32% from, from the field and 24% from three. But then the Thunder made their, their first big run, 15-4, to four, to go by 13. The Hawks missed seven straight shots, as they kept doing in this game. At that point, they were shooting 27% from the field. Uh, Jung a technical foul that was kind of weird and Quinn argued about because it was kind of because it was touching the rim or grabbing the rim in live action and Quinn could be heard yelling on the broadcast and I quote what's he supposed to do <laughs> which is kind of funny um, there was a nice response by the Hawks late in the quarter to actually cut the lead down to five um, with a big th- three by, by Murray but then Trey uh, committed a ill-advised foul let's just say he fouled he fouled Lou Dort with like literally 0.1 to go in the first half at a, at a bad time when the Hawks actually had some juice going at that point also, just not a smart play at all from a guy who is smart in Trey. Um, Dort's an improved shooter, but not somebody that you need to be flying at like that at the end of the half. Uh, just a bad moment for him mentally. And that put the Hawks down by eight at the half as a result. And they just couldn't make a shot. I mean, I said it before, but here are the numbers. 29% from the floor in the first half. 29% from the floor in the first half. And 622 from three. Only one guy shot better than 40% from the field out of the nine guys who played for the Hawks in the first half. It was Bogey at four of eight. Hunter was two of 10. Jalen was two of 10. Trey was two of seven. Um, Capella was one of four. Hunter uh, Hunter was, uh, I talked about him earlier already. DeJounte was three of eight. O of two for Matthews. O of two for McCongu. Nobody could make a shot other than Bogey in the first half. And I guess DeJounte was, was respectable at three and eight, three for eight. But um, yeah, I mean, Bogey and Murray made some threes, but nobody else could. Anyway, they crushed the possession battle, but all that stuff, like defensively, they played well and just didn't matter because they just could not make shots. Um, after halftime, I don't expect this before. I thought the third quarter was pretty maddening slash frustrating from the Hawks. Um, they actually had a nice start to the to the half, cutting the lead down to four, but then it ballooned up again with 11-2 run by the Thunder. The Hawks just couldn't make a shot again, 4-13 from the floor. It's one play. I didn't love that the Hawks came out of a timeout and had Hunter take a step back and test it too. Didn't like that. The Hawks finally made some shots actually though. Much better as far as like, it's a low bar to clear than the first half. But the, defensively, it, they let down. So OKC scored 30 points in the first nine minutes of the third quarter. They shot very well. Um, the Hawks scored two points in four and a half minutes at one point of the third as well, an 11-2 to two run. I thought the Hawks played awful, honestly, in the third. They were down by 19 at the end of the period. Um, they lost the quarter by 11 points. They finally made some more shots again, but had seven turnovers in the third quarter alone, including four from Trey, who was really bad in the third, I thought. They only got to the line twice. So all of their like positive indicators from the first half um, subsided and all of the poor ones continued, which is not good for what you want. The Thunder shot the ball well, for sure. Made some lucky shots, I thought, but still the Hawks just played flat out poorly in the third. And that dug them a hole they couldn't get out of. So they did do what they had to do in this game and they were chipping away the whole fourth quarter. It was down to 13 pretty quickly. I thought Congo had a great defensive possession against Jalen Williams in space. Locked him up one-on-one. It was good to see that. Um, defensively was much better in the fourth overall, I thought, from the Hawks. There was a pretty bad challenge by Quinn with about eight, eight minutes to go. No harm done, really, but um, the ball was off of Giddy's leg, and then it hit Trey in the foot on the way out, and Trey kind of reacted like it was not off him. Um, and by the time I think everyone figured out it was definitely going to be off Trey, the challenge is already happening. So that was a bad moment. Didn't really bite them, but still. Um, they played, actually, 
for the first time all year that I have found, they played about 90 seconds without a center in the middle of the fourth quarter. Now, Holmgren was not on the floor for the, for the Thunder, so the Thunder were, were playing quite small as well. And the Hawks chose to give Okongwu a quick breather with Jalen at the five rather than going back to Clint, which, by the way, I agree with that choice. Now, I'm obviously very high on Clint, but in this matchup in particular, not Clint's best matchup in the world, and the Hawks were down, crucially, 10, 12 points. So what you want there is offense. And they didn't need Clint as far as like someone to match up with a big center because the Thunder were playing small. So I liked that. It was sort of scheme and matchup specific, but it happened in the fourth. Wanted to point that out. The Hawks did climb back in the game. You know, Trey um, actually missed a floater that would have made it seven, but got they got a stop. DeJounte made a, made a three to cut the lead to six. Um, back and forth, back and forth from there. Trey actually broke the paint, made a floater. Um, as close as it got was a Kongwu with a second chance bucket off of a Trey miss with about two minutes to go. And they got it down to five at that point. But then the big swing of the night happened back in OKC's favor. Um, Jalen Williams made a very tough shot, like a hat tip shot to him around Jalen Johnson to go back up by seven. And then Trey kind of just tried to force an ill-advised three. It was blocked. It ended up with a run out and a lob dunk, and it was back to nine. And that was kind of it. Now, it wasn't over there because Murray got the, got the free throw line right away. They actually, Jalen, once once more, the Hawks got the ball again, um, and actually was a loose ball foul on Chet Holmgren. Jalen went to the line, down seven. He split them with one minute to go. Now, look, you're down seven with, with a minute to go. You're going to lose way more often than not. But he missed a free throw. They actually had a great defensive possession initially for Shea to a bad shot at the end of the shot clock. But then Holmgren put, put the game away with a three, with three-point play at the very end, and that was it. So a couple of you know big plays, honestly, that, that blocked three by Trey, that led to a run-out dunk. And then at the very end, kind of the final dagger was that missed. It wasn't necessarily a missed box. That was kind of, it was kind of a long rebound right to Holmgren, kind of a bad moment all, all the way around. But anyway, the Hawks got <laughs> all scored 40 points in the, in the fourth quarter, which is a lot. They made more shots because the last 15 times, it just wasn't enough to overcome the rest of the game. And look, big picture, once again, it just wasn't a complete enough game. Like the Hawks, I, I know my friend Glenn on the podcast talked with me last week about this. They haven't had a lot of complete games in this, uh, this in this season so far, despite the fact that they are above water wins and losses wise. But uh, in this one, they basically had one good quarter and it was the fourth and look, the process, again, in the first half wasn't so bad. They just didn't make shots. But the third quarter was maddening, and that, time, that kind of dug the hole, and there you go. Okay, we'll have more on this game when it comes to the player-by-player -player evaluations of what transpired. But first, a word from our sponsors on today's show. Today's show is brought to you by Jace Medical, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the world today. It's important to be prepared. That's why Jace Medical is offering the Jace case. The Jace case is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common deadly bacterial infections. You, also, you can also customize your case and add additional life-saving medications based on your unique needs. Jace Medical all, now offers you choices that are different for your Jace case with dozens of add-on medications available. Choose the medications that fit best for you and your family's unique needs. They are also continuing always always to work on expanding their medication offerings with new additions all the time and with jace medical you can also buy a gift card for your family or loved ones so they can get a jace case of their own with jace medical you, you will never be caught unprepared which is something i know is very valuable in every aspect of life and jacemedical.com is the place to go enter promo code locked on at checkout for a 20 dollar discount on your order that is promo code locked on at j-a-s-e medical.com jacemedical.com promo code locked on Okay, and we'll dive into the players now who appear. I know I mentioned it once before. Garrison Matthews played four minutes in this game, missed two threes. And uh, you know, this is a very simple evaluation. I'm not trying to give you – it's not. I'm not, I'm not acting like this is uh, rocket science. But Garrison Matthews has to make shots if he's going to play. He was 0 of 2 from 3, and they were both good looks. He just missed them. That happens. Not, no one's going to make all their shots, but I think he needed to make those, obviously. Always make one of them. Uh, minus 5 in four minutes. One rebound. I think he looked – fine on the court just to make a shots and uh look i will say there's been some garrison matthews slander today it's not his fault that he played over aj um as a reminder i think garrison matthews is an nba player he's proven as the, he's proven as such like this is a guy who's played for a handful of seasons and was in the rotation for a lot of different teams etc like he's 27 years old he's played you know he's actually started 57 games in the nba he's been a career 37 three, three point shooter like this is a guy this is a real guy he's not like this he's not someone who's just like arriving out of nowhere but again I play AJ over him. It is what it is. Um, to the rest of the uh, the rest of the guys who actually played real minutes in this game, Akangwu twenty five minutes, seven points, fourteen rebounds. That's a huge number for Akangwu. Uh, two turnovers, 
three away from the floor, one of oh, one from three. Um, offensively, it was not his best work, but on the glass, he was huge. And then defensively, he gave them a different element that they actually needed in this game. Um, I was certainly on board with closing with him in this spot, especially because they were losing. But even if they weren't, it's just a better matchup for him in a lot of ways than it is for Capella. And that was apparent um, all night long. Uh, Sadiq Bey played well off the bench. 15 points, eight rebounds, two assists for Sadiq. Uh, he and Bogey were the guys who shot the ball well, other than Murray from three, who also was red hot at one point. Um, but Sadiq, three of six from three, two of five, sorry, three of five on twos. I thought he gave them good energy. Actually had their best plus minus, was plus six in this game and played well. Um, I was, again, I was kind of not, 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 not shocked, but a little bit surprised they chose this game in particular to go kind of with Jalen for the first time against a smaller group because, you know, Bay could hold up pretty well in this in, in this matchup, but um, I don't mind it because I, I think Jalen probably has earned that spot at this point, but I think Bay played well. Uh, Bogey, 17 points off the bench. He was 7 14 from the floor, 3 of 8 from 3, had two steals, had three assists. He looked good too. Like, they were at their best in this game when it was Bogey and Bay playing together, which is interesting. Like, that's a lot of that I don't usually love because of the defense, but in this game, that was just enough on offense. They actually made some shots and uh, both played pretty well. Um, two starters. Capella, six points, 12 rebounds, two blocks, and a steal. He was two of five from the floor and two of four from three. Not his best, but I thought he was okay. Again, a bad matchup for Capella. Like you're playing against either Chet Holmgren, who can shoot from 28 feet, or guys who are power forward size or smaller. Like there's just not really anywhere to hide Clint. Um, it was basically he's either got to guard Holmgren or he's got to guard someone like Lou Dort, who Lou Dort's probably more qualified than some guys in that matchup would be. And uh, I thought Clint did a good job overcoming it, but was not his best, obviously, which is okay. Um, Jalen Johnson was not efficient in this game. 13 points on 15 shots. He actually was uh, 0 of 4 from 3. He was okay from 2, 6 for 11. But he, along with everybody else, just couldn't make a shot in this game. Five assists, though. Three steals and a block. Actually was minus 16. Did not play his best basketball, but uh, I thought he was, like, you know, not terrible by any means. Uh, Hunter was really rough in this game. Eight points on 13 shots. One of seven from three, one of five from inside the arc. Uh, sorry, one of six from inside the arc. Two rebounds, no assists. Um, kind of back to old Hunter in a lot of ways in this game. Now, I will give him this. Um, the fact that he took seven threes is actually probably encouraging because he had the finger issue, of course, on Saturday. I didn't even know if he was going to be on the injury report. He wasn't at all listed, which is good to see. And he was at least willing to shoot, but uh, not his best work in this game on offense. Uh, and defensively, he was actually okay against Shea, I thought, for the most part, until the second half where he, he got cut loose. But that wasn't really on, on Hunter, in my opinion. And then to the backcourt. Um, on the positive side, DeJounte shot the ball very well from three. He was the only guy who made like all the shots in the starting lineup in this game. 29 points on a weird line here. He was one of seven on twos, which is awful. But he was six of nine on threes, which is obviously incredible. And then not a ten at the line. So... A weirdly, a weirdly efficient game for Dejounte, but not because he made shots inside the arc. Like you don't ever see one of seven from two and six of nine from three. That happened for Dejounte in this game. And Tiffany throw attempts is good. I think he was good at attacking the rim, uh, especially late in the game. He gave them some uh, good possessions in the fourth quarter. He was pretty good, I thought. Um, Trey was not very good in this game. Now Trey, um, only a few guys in the league can play what I would describe as not very well, and end up with twenty two points and eleven assists. So you have to look beyond that. If you watch this game, Trey just didn't play very well. He had seven turnovers. He was not in control for the most part. Defensively, he competed, I thought, but just really inefficient. He was four of 13 on twos and one of five from three. Um, got to the line 11 times and made all 11. So, like, I always say it, but it, it is true. Like, you have to keep that in mind. Trey gets to the line a ton. That's a skill in itself. He makes, he makes free throws, and that is something you can't just gloss over. But I'll say this now. This season now, we're, this is seven games. Trey is shooting. 41 of 122 from the floor. That is 33.6% from the field. That's obviously brutal. He is 12 of 44 from three as well, 27%. So um, do I think that that's going to stay there? No, I don't. Um, but it's something like, if, if okay, I'll say this. If Trey had a B-plus Trey game in this game, the Hawks might have won. If Trey had an A-plus game, the Hawks would have won, I think. But even if you just ask for like a, you know, a, a, an above average Trey game, I think the Hawks would have been right there in the end of this one. And it's not just him. Like, again, I've said it before, but most guys didn't shoot the ball well. I think there were three guys that shot the ball well in this game, and they were Bogey, Bay, and Murray. Everybody else, you know, the same can be said for, you know, Knights when Hunter and Johnson shoot 8 of 28 from the floor and 1 of 11 from 3, that's hard to overcome. For your, your starting forwards, do that. That's rough. And you throw in Trey, being as inefficient as he was, with seven turnovers, um, that's going to be tough. So, 
that's three starters. Like I, I'm not gonna do the math again, but I believe they were 13, three of them combined for 13 of 46 from the field, and what two of 16 from three. You're gonna lose most of the time, especially when one of those guys is your best player in Trey Young. So I don't have any a grand evaluation to give you. I'm not worried about Trey. People keep asking me. I understand. Like I thought he was great actually in, on Saturday, the second half in particular, but he's gonna have to be more efficient. And, uh, you know, it's still a small sample size right now. I think he's always been a slow starter. That's worth noting. I know it's not, like, satisfying. Um, I got the usual round of, like, oh, what's this? Look, he's still leading the league in assists, at least total assists right now. He's still been a positive contributor. And his defense has been better than it's ever been, I think, this, so far this year. But uh, he was not good tonight. No, no question about it. No way to explain that away. And he's got to be better than this. And I'm sure he knows that. And uh, we'll see how he responds to this one moving forward. Speaking of moving forward. Before we get out of here, the Hawks have a big game actually on Thursday. They have two days off, one of which for travel on Tuesday. They're actually staying OKC okay, tonight and flying on Tuesday to Mexico City. Yes, Mexico City. Um, I talked about this a little bit over the summer, and we'll have more of that later this week as well. But the Hawks are playing Orlando in a special NBA game in Mexico City. It's actually a late game, despite being two East Coast teams. It's a 9:30 start, NBA TV National. Only one of two games. There's actually two games only on Thursday. And the Hawks are the late game. So that's interesting in itself. So pseudo-national. I, I always don't call NBA TV national, but it's kind of national in some respects. It's an Orlando home game as well. Just want to note that. And the first time the Hawks have ever played in Mexico City. The Hawks actually, the NBA has played like 30 plus games there in the last 30 plus years. But the Hawks never played there. That's, no, that's notable. So some extra national attention on this one for sure. The team has some like some pre-game engagements um, in the city, I believe, on Tuesday or Wednesday. So we'll have at least one show between now and then, but certainly a big game to monitor a standalone spot for the whole league to be watching the Hawks on Thursday, 930 against Orlando. And by the way, Orlando's playing well to begin the season. So that'll be a very, very interesting game. Division rivals, all that stuff. So um, stay tuned for that, and we'll have full coverage between now and Thursday. Also, PSA, you may see a postcast episode from the Locked On Sports Atlanta crew in the audio-only feeds of this show after some games, which, which I believe uh, will be happening again this week. Um, so check that out. It's from the network. I'm not involved in that show, but certainly uh, you are encouraged to listen to it. Um, it'll be sort of a compliment to what we already do here, and it's got different hosts, and it's, again, from the network, Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it'll be in your audio-only feeds. YouTube. It will not be in the same feed. They have their own YouTube feed, but it'll be in our audio feed. Just check that out and not don't be spooked by that. I'm not going anywhere. I keep getting questions about that. Every couple of days now, I'm getting a question about that. So um, no changes here, just some extra bonus content in your audio feeds. Also, I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, um, Google Podcasts, Overcast, all those places. We're also on YouTube on the video side. So likes and subscriptions appreciated there as well. Ratings, reviews, please tell a friend or two or three about the podcast. If you have a Hawks fan friend in your life, share the podcast with them. Hopefully they will enjoy it as well. Also, I am on Twitter slash X at BT Roland. The show is there as well at Locked on Hawks. I write about the Hawks at patreon.com slash BT Roland. That's encouraged. You can check that out as well. And with all that said, I appreciate everyone for listening to the show. As always, the Hawks will have a pretty interesting game on Thursday, and we'll see you all later in the week.